Okay. Um, well, let's, I think, kick it off. Uh, first, I uh, just want to thank everyone for coming today. This is our first peer networking event of 2021. Uh, before I begin, just want to go over some logistics quickly. Uh, first, as mentioned before, please sign your name in the chat box. Um, this is important if you wish to obtain AICP CM credits. Second, we ask that you keep your microphone muted during the presentations today. We will have time for questions after each presentation, uh, so you can either use the chat box to type your question or use the raise hand feature to indicate that you would like to ask a question. Uh, following the, quest uh, the presentations, we will break off into small groups for about 40 minutes to discuss questions and issues related to the topics today, um, and the breakouts will be led by PSRC staff. As a final note, we will record the panel presentations and we'll make them, along with the notes from the breakout sessions, available to attendees following the event. Switching gears, let me stop sharing my screen for a second. Uh, switching gears to the topic, um, we have um, a really great panel today. Um, and I think, as we all know, transit has been hit particularly hard as a result of COVID-19. Um, and transit agencies and other organizations that work on transit have had to work hard to evaluate the impacts both in the short and the long term. Uh, so today we're going to hear perspectives from three organizations that are working closely to understand the impacts to transit from COVID um, in Seattle and King County in particular, and what to consider as future planning efforts are impacted by reduced budgets. Uh, first, we will hear from Eric Rundell, a transportation planner at King County Metro, who's going to discuss revisions to rapid ride planning efforts, as well as the long range plan uh, Metro Connects, and the priorities considered in making those decisions. Uh, next, we will hear from Kevin Futhi, who's the executive director at Commute Seattle, and he's going to discuss the impacts to transit ridership and commuting uh, with a particular focus of to and from Seattle and what we can learn from this for the future. Uh, we're gonna finish off uh, with a presentation from Hester Sarabrin, who's the policy director at Transportation Choices Coalition, who's going to provide an overview of their COVID recovery framework, which carefully considers how to center racial equity, fill funding gaps and prioritize transit in the near future. Uh, so without further ado, I think I can hand it off to Eric if you are ready. Great. And Ben, should I share my screen with slides or? If that is your preference, I uh, okay. can also share your slides if you would like. Uh, I will share the slides. That will make it easy. Great. So. Okay. Good morning, all. Um, as Ben said, my name is Eric Rundle. I'm a transportation planner at King County Metro. I've been working on updating um, our Metro Connects network update as part of our broader update of our um, long range vision. Then also I've been working on various um, COVID related recovery efforts around um, service and tracking ridership for that. So I'm just going to um, talk mainly about the impacts of COVID on Metro overall, including our ridership, um, service, and social equity impacts. And then I'll start, start to talk about um, our recovery planning efforts and then also touch on you know, um, our long range plan update and rapid ride issues that uh, ben, ben mentioned. And so just to start off, um, most most of you probably are familiar with, here, I'm gonna move this over. Let me know if you lost your screen. Oops, sorry. We'll reshare on the screen. There. Okay. Uh, as most of you know, most transit agencies, including Metro, um, saw a really large drop in ridership starting with, with the pandemic um, in March and through April. And so the, the lower line, I'm sorry, there's the same, generally the same color. The lower line is 2020 ridership by month. And then the upper line, which is slightly lighter gray, is our 2019 ridership by month. As you can sort of see that the difference where we started out in January and February uh, at pretty similar levels and then really saw a drop down from around 400,000 riders a day on average to um, now about 100 to 150,000 riders uh, throughout the year. And we really, really haven't seen much of a, uh, an increase back in ridership throughout the pandemic. 
Um, in the summer, we just saw an increase going up from you know 100 at the bottom to 150,000 a day. But um, starting in October, when we reinstated fares, uh, and then as the second wave or third wave of the pandemic started in the, in the fall and the winter, we saw ridership decline again all through November and December, um, where it was back down to just above 100,000 riders per day. Um, and then looking at the pattern of you know, how and where that ridership changed. So this, this is from the March through June, those first several months where we saw the large declines uh, by period of the day. So we saw that the largest decrease on a percentage basis was actually in those commute periods, so the AM and PM peak. Uh, and those saw the, the quickest and largest declines. Uh, and then it's really the midday, evening, and night service where things did not decline as much. And they also saw that those periods, but particularly the midday, is where, um, as we started to see that small recovery in ridership, where it, that growth happened, as opposed to the AM peak period, which is almost primarily commuters, which really bottomed out and then really did not see much of an increase in terms of the, the ridership during that period. And then when we look at the change based on the type of service, so whether it's frequent or not frequent uh, bus line, or whether it was a, a bus line that provided all day service or peak only, um, we see that the, the largest declines were among, first on the, on the, on the right-hand side, you see it's really those peak only routes that provide that service just during the peak, not surprisingly, it's the largest decline and no, and no increase as ridership recovered and then it's not quite as dramatic but it's really on the, the left side you see that um, the sort of local less frequent routes saw a little more decline than the, the frequent all day routes uh, in terms of um, total ridership loss and then in terms of today we're at in february uh, we've had many months now of where we've been dealing with covid our ridership this month is about 125,000 riders per day, which is you know 30% of what it was last from last February. Uh, and so the map on the on the right hand side here shows the 10 routes that have the highest ridership currently, and then the 10 routes that have the lowest ridership. And I think it's uh, I'll touch on this in a little bit, but it's important to keep in mind a lot of our service um, and some of our routes are fully suspended, so those are not even captured in this because they're, they're not having any ridership. Um, but the general pattern, so the yellow routes are those that have, I um, mean, have the highest ridership currently, and those tend to be a rapid ride system, uh, or and or, you know, routes that were pretty high ridership before the pandemic, and coincidentally are also ones that we're planning to be ridership in, in the near term or longer term as part of our metric next plan. Um, I think almost every single yellow route is either existing wrapper ride, plan to be a wrapper ride, or as a candidate be a wrapper ride in our long range plan versus the blue routes, which are, are um, the lowest 10, almost all exclusively express oriented routes. So we still see that same pattern from earlier in the spring and summer where the express all day routes are having the lowest ridership and having the least return. And so you see a lot of the blue ones, particularly ones that go on the freeway and some of the a um, couple of those on Vashon Island where there's less commuting happening, they're seeing really low ridership, even, and these are the ones that are not suspended. Hey, Eric, can I yeah. just pause really quick? And um, it looks like we're just getting the, the notes view of the PowerPoint. Can we try to hit full screen just to oh, get a better view of the map? Sorry. And I can't see this challenge no the screen up either. Yeah, this is the classic PowerPoint challenges. All right, so let's see here. We might have to unshare and yeah. reshare. Yeah. Apologies. I'm just going to try it again. How's that? Unfortunately, still see if you, I think on the bottom right, if you click the, um, I do the, the little slideshow. podium slideshow. Now we're seeing if you go to display nice. settings now, <laughs> now we're getting your, your speaker notes. Yeah. Um, oh, oh boy. Fun. I think the swap, if you press the swap, that might work. How's that? Perfect. Okay. All right. Apologies. Sorry. So, so no one actually see all those great charts. 
<laughs> I can flip back. We can see them. It was just a little bit, a little bit oh, uh, small. small. Okay. Apologies for that. Um, and I can't see the chat, so I'll maybe at the end I'll look at for questions, um, and then we can so try to look at them throughout. Um, and then so in terms of what affect the, both the ridership, but then also um, our, 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 along with decreases in ridership, we also had decrease in fares and then also tax revenue. So our budget situation has been pretty affected. So between the ridership loss and revenue loss, um, we've definitely made a lot of changes to service. So we're currently operating about 85% of service from what we had pre-pandemic. And, and a lot of that's because um, we have some routes, entire routes or portions of routes that are currently suspended service. And so the map uh, on the right shows that, that you know, those blue, dark, the darker blue ones are the ones that are just operating at their normal um, service levels as they were pre-pandemic. The light blue ones are those that have some reduced service in terms of the number of trips that are operating at different times a day, it could be a weekday or a, or a weekend even. And then yellow ones, which primarily are those express routes, but there's also some local routes, are the ones that are um, fully suspended and just have not been operating. And so you can sort of see the pattern that I think a lot of those that are fully operating are tend to be in Seattle, but also a lot in South King County. And that was intentional around some of our um, decisions based one, who's still riding. So who are those essential workers or essential trips are being taken? And we'll, I'll talk about this a little later on too, uh, but then also around, and this sort of aligns with who's still riding some of the demographics and social equity implications too of um, the, the transit network. And so of those that are suspended, um, you know, the vast majority are is peak only service. Um, and then we have a few, um, few all day routes that are also suspended and those tend to be more local routes that serve um, lower density areas where they're we're not seeing as much uh, ridership. Um, but as you did at 49, the vast majority are, um, you know, peak only routes and then we're just not providing that service um, any longer. And, at least in the near term. And then another uh, another effect of our on our service has been that we've placed artificial limitations on the passenger limits on buses, and that's to really maintain social distancing, so that it, um, it doesn't feel too crowded and that people have space and trying to keep that at minimum six six feet of distance. And so our current limits are that no more than twelve people on a regular forty foot long bus, and then no more than eighteen people on a longer articulated bus. Um, but this has right, presented some challenges for our service. So um, even though ridership has dropped you know, by um, you know, 60 to 75% over the period of the pandemic, there still are you know, on average well over 100,000 people riding a day. And that's not evenly distributed throughout the system. So there are certain routes, um, even if they have full regular service that have more ridership. And with these limitations in place, create some challenges in that there's um, certain times a day, people are, they're reaching these limits and then drivers are passing stops by when they're, they're quote unquote full. And, and so we're seeing these pass ups, which definitely affects our riders who are still needing to use the bus to get to work, get to um, uh, essential trips or the grocery shopping or the doctor's office. Uh, and it just makes a, the transit network less reliable um, for, the, for those people. Uh, and, and we're seeing that this is often taking place in the afternoon, in the afternoon peak uh, peak period when reserves, as we've seen a shift in our, the change in our service profile from being very peak oriented to now more of a plateau where it's usually late afternoon is where the highest point of ridership is occurring. And then also just note, so as the direct diagram shows below, these load limits are about um, less than 25% of what the actual capacity of the buses we are running are at. So we're less, so even though we're running full service on some of these routes, the actual ability of those routes to um, uh, move people is less than a quarter of what they were pre-pandemic. So that's an important point to keep in mind. Uh, and then the implications on this for different types of communities. So we have and this is from our Metro Connects plan and our service guidelines. We have two different types of classifications for routes, whether it's a 
route that it serves um, uh, minority populations based on census demographics, and then whether it's also serves low income areas. And so as we see, similar to those charts earlier, based on the first few months that the routes that had the more, a larger decline in ridership were those that um, were not the non-minority designated routes or the non-low income designated routes. So in, in the inverse, it's really that those people are still riding um, tend to be air, in areas that have higher minority populations or higher low income populations. And then this map um, is up from our June, a June snapshot, which reflects the end of that period in the charts earlier, sort of shows that on a route by route basis. So those in the top 10% on a percentile decline. So this is slightly different from the map earlier. We're showing total ridership. This is actually based on the percent decline. Um, but those with the largest declines were um, tend to be in the northern part of the county and the east side, often again, peak only express routes, um, often using the freeway system where those with the smallest decline, even if it was a, the route didn't have that higher ridership to begin with, but really didn't decline much, are almost entirely concentrated in South King County um, with the exception of the Route 7, which goes through the Rainier Valley. Uh, and then also um, a lot of our rap ride routes were also some of those that have maintained their ridership the most, even though they've still seen large declines. And so this, this pattern is something we've seen pretty consistently throughout the pandemic. and it, sort of provides that guide of, of those 100 plus thousand people who are still riding a day, um, where, where, where are they traveling? What routes are they using? Uh, and and it gives indication of who, who's still using it for essential trips. Um, and, then, and this gets to that, the point, crowding point I was making earlier, is that when we look at those routes that are trying to pass people by, and based on our classifications of whether it's a designated low income route or a designated minority route, we see in the orange bars that the number of trips that are having these pass ups are um, almost primarily on routes that are either designated minority or, or low income. And that's partly due to, you know, in the map earlier showing that most of the ridership um, that is occurring is, is happening on routes in the south end. Um, but then even though we're running full service on a lot of these routes, um, just that the reduced capacity means that they can't carry as much, even though people are still using it. And that's where we're seeing these pass ups. And so the A line is one of the routes that we're seeing. Um, this is the most common. Uh, and so the A line for people who aren't uh, familiar is the our rabbi route that runs along Highway 99 from Federal Way to uh, SeaTac to the airport. And so this chart on the left or right shows in orange what the total capacity is based on the service we're providing. So pre-pandemic, pre you can put you know 450 people an hour plus on a, on a bus given how many buses we're running. Um, but then the light blue line shows given our restrictions we've had in place, what how many people can we actually carry? And then the, the darkest line shows um, based on the actual ridership the average maximum ridership we're seeing. Um, there are instances where, especially in the late afternoon, where we're seeing, um, in some instances, pop, or ridership actually getting to or above that threshold. And that's partly because um, it's really up to the driver as if they let people on. And their the driver is the one that's having to keep track of, are they at that tw uh, 12 or 18 threshold? And sometimes they don't actually, you know, you know, it's hard to tell when you're driving exactly where you're at. So there are instances where we're exceeding the threshold or then they're passing people by. And it's, that's in this late afternoon period or early, you know, early evening. And so to, to address this, we're actually providing uh, what we call supplemental service. We have unscheduled trips that we're providing um, and deploying a target away to certain routes and sorts of times of day when we do see these instances of pass ups and crowding. And it's really so in some of these, so some of these routes, like the A-line, we're actually now operating more service than we were pre-pandemic because we have our we're running at our fully scheduled service, plus we're adding in all these supplemental trips in addition. So there's actually more buses running on some of these routes. Um, and we're still dealing with some of these issues where some routes have been entirely suspended and have zero service. So that's sort of like the, the extremes of how we're having to manage the system and that some areas 
um, we need more service other areas but the ridership and the budget don't even justify running the existing service uh, and then so looking forward we're currently in the process of um, updating our long-range plan and our strategic plan and our service guidelines and um, you know a lot, a lot of the lessons we've learned from the pandemic and our current service as well as um, our focus on social equity and those essential trips we're using that some of that those lessons and updating those those plans uh, but then we're also now starting to look at um, restoring some of the service that's been suspended so you know we have 15 percent of our service that's currently suspended um, we're looking to um, begin restoring and growing our service back to where we were starting in September. Um, and we're in the, just beginning that process now. So on, on the right, we actually have a survey that's out on our website, trying to get input on our different um, priorities about how much and where and the types of service that we restore. Um, and then the, the three priorities we have in our restoration process that we've established are really focused on one, equity. So that's um, routes that have higher what we call opportunity scores. It's really based on um, the, the demographics of the populations they serve, and also looking at you know what routes are currently or did serve um, uh, more people. So what's the higher ridership routes? Then also trying to address um, these crowding issues, and then that's going to be a tricky one because assuming at some point we'll actually lift the load limits that we have in place once the pandemic subsides and there's not as much of a need for social distancing, there's still likely some issues of crowding uh, on our buses as people begin to return to work and trying to understand that and where, where those trips need, are needed to prevent crowding, which would probably be different from what was pre-pandemic is another, another challenge. But those are the three priorities we're looking at as we go forward. Um, and then also just touch on um, some of the longer term beyond just re restoring the service suspended, um, some of the more near-term impacts of, for our particularly on our budget have been that, um, you know, we we cut our capital budget a lot, which means our, our operating program was reduced. So there were a number of uh, lines, particularly the K line over on the east side and the R line, which goes, which is the route seven was, um, were put on hold. So we were in the process of planning of those becoming wrapper ride and, and those not, were not maintained in our budget. And so they've been put off to be done at a later point when we have a um, budget for those. Um, and we're sort of just moving forward with those routes that are already in the process um, or already have funding identified pre-pandemic. So in addition to six routes that we have currently operating, there's those there are four routes that we were planning and they have funding going forward. And so one is the H line, which um, is the current 120, which runs through Delridge to Burien. Uh, the G line, which will run up and down Madison in, Street in Seattle, um, the J line, which will replace the 70, which will go from um, downtown through East Lake to UW. And then the last one is the I line, which will um, go from Auburn up to Brenton. And those are the four that we're planning on now. And the future wrap ride lines will sort of depend on funding, but also uh, additional planning that we're planning to do as part of our long range plan over the next two to three years. So with that, I think those are the end of my slides. Um, I can stop and take Great. questions. I don't know if anyone can see anything in the chat particularly, so. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any questions in the chat, but we definitely have a few minutes if anyone is interested in asking any questions. Thank you, Eric, that was fascinating. Just a, one more minute in case anyone's typing. I would put another plug in too. We have, we just put in a new rider dashboard on our website, which has a lot of this ridership and other data available for the public, even by our route by route level. So if you're interested, you can actually, I don't have the web address offhand, but you can probably Google it and find um, it on our website. And if you want to dig into it more. Looks like we have one question so far it's from Tracy Jones. Do you have any long-term plans for line A to build TOD to serve people of color? I don't think for the, it, and I, I don't work on this, so it's probably not the best person to answer, but I know we are doing um, 
TOD work around our wrap ride lines and, and other um, facilities related to our park and rides. I don't think the A line is one of those. I think what the work we're doing is in Burien and Shoreline, at least in the near term, in terms of um, some TOD planning and maybe Kenmore with the parking right up there. Um, but I think it's something we want to expand and do more of, hopefully. Well, thank you again. If there are no other questions, I think we can move along to our second panel presentation. And if again, if, if anyone has any questions that come up afterwards, uh, please feel free to either put them in the chat box or just follow up um, personally. Um, but now we can move on to Kevin Futhi um, from Commute Seattle, who's going to discuss impacts to transit ridership and commuting to and from downtown Seattle. Um, so Kevin, I have your slides. I can pull them up if that is still what you want. Perfect, that'd be great. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, just one second. I got my own PowerPoint issues to work through today. Okay. All right, is that, people can see that? Looks good, full screen. Got it, yep. Good, all right. So uh, thanks again to Ben. Um, I'm Kevin Futhi, I'm Executive Director of Commute Seattle. Um, thanks for having me here today. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be on this panel with Eric and Hester um, and with all of you. I hope I'll be sharing some um, data that's new to you, just looking around the room. Some of this may be uh, familiar to you if you've seen our mode split data before, but hopefully I've got some Easter eggs and nuggets in there that you haven't seen and might be uh, of, of interest. So, um, with that, let's go to the next slide. Um, many of you may have seen this, where Commute Seattle is kind of famous for producing this biennial um, center city mode split uh, that describes how people get to work in downtown Seattle. We've done this for a number of, of cycles now through our commute trip reduction program in partnership with SDOT. Um, but what this, what we're really trying to drive home, at least you know, pre pre-pandemic, we, we produced this data in early 2020 based on the 2019 survey cycle. So fall of 2019 was the data collection. And right before we started working from home, we, uh, we published this. So this is sort of the snapshot of where we were kind of the day before, uh, so to speak. You know, uh, commuting into downtown Seattle was, uh, was like this. We had just a 26% drive alone rate. Um, that, that red section there represents transit, about 46%. Um, that blue section down there at the bottom is carpooling and vanpooling. So if you add that together with transit and you look at the shared modes where people are, are together in vehicles, uh, whether it's a bus or a vanpool or a carpool, it's about 55% of, of all trips. So the majority of trips to downtown work sites were made, but large and small work sites, uh, were made in uh, via a shared mode, which obviously now is a little bit problematic. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit. But you also see the little slices there for telework, for biking and walking. Um, I'm going to drill down a little bit more into those in the next slide. Uh, ben, if you want to advance it. Okay. Now this one, you might have to uh, minimize your screen. You know your your. Uh, window so you can see the columns there on the far right. I'm going to do that myself. Um, they say never to do this in PowerPoint, like put up a slide full of, of numbers, but I, I hope you'll bear with me. I'll, I'm going to talk you through this a little bit because I think it's super interesting. So what I have here is the modes down the left, the you know, transit, driving alone, etc. cetera, um, our 2010 data and then our 2019 data. So you can see the change that happened over those, those nine or 10 years. And the, the reason I wanted to share this was just to show kind of it, the sudden changes that we're seeing right now, right, are monumental. There, there was nothing like this over the last 10 years. But the big things that did happen, I wanted to point out, I highlighted there, which was the drive alone rate did decrease pretty significantly uh, from 2010 to 2019. And, and the context there as well is that over that time, downtown added about 100,000 jobs. So this, this work that Commute Seattle does, especially with employers and property managers to try to incentivize 
fewer drive alone trips, more transit, active commutes, and telework, you know, over all this time, this is kind of like what we got over those nine or 10 years. We saw the drive alone rate drop from about 35% down to about 26%. Um, in real terms though, because of the increased number of jobs, like I said, the total, the absolute number, the net new drive alone trips still ticked up a little bit. But in that final column, all the way on the right, you'll see, you know, what I did there was I said, okay, well, if we still had the 2010 drive alone rate in 2019, you know, how many, how many net trips did we save by lowering the rate from 35 to 26? And it's about 26,000 trips that we kind of eliminated because of the mode shift over that time, right? And so if you think about it, okay, there's about 75, 80,000, let's say drive alone trips in 2019 pre-pandemic. You know, we would have had over 100,000 uh, if we had kept the 2010 mode split. So, but because of the investments that we made in transit with our all, all the partners that are on this call, Metro, obviously Link Light Rail, the ferry systems, everything, plus all the TDM work that we're doing to try to get more Orca cards into people's hands to increase, uh, increase telework opportunities, et cetera, you know, build out a bike network all of those little things had a big impact in moving some of those people to other modes. Um, and you'll see there wasn't any one big thing that kind of absorbed that drop in drive alone rate. Some of it went to transit, which ticked up from you know 42% to close to 46% over this time. Um, carpooling, you know, kind of unchanged, maybe down slightly, carpool and van pools like within the margin of error. Walking went up a bit, biking went up a little bit, telecommuting more than doubled over this time frame, And that was kind of the headline that we ran with um, in early 2020, again, pre-pandemic, when we were thinking about, okay, what's the big headline uh, from this data this time around? It, we decided the, the story here is kind of, wow, telecommuting is really taking off. And of course, at the time, we had no idea what we were about to be in for uh, with, with the pandemic and, and this like absolutely uh, unprecedented sudden change in the way that people commute. Uh, I hope that's interesting and, and illustrative for you guys just to see, you know, the numbers, the net change in, in that we saw in commuting. Um, and, and it provides, I think, some context of the opportunity and, and just crazy landscape that we're in now with all these sudden changes. Um, next slide. So again, uh, shared modes, like just I'm going to hit a couple of highlights. Pre-pandemic, 55% of trips into the center of city by commuters were on a shared mode, either transit, carpool, or van pool. Majority of commuters taking these modes, um, that's, now, uh, that's now a, uh, a challenge for, for many commuters. Uh, next slide. The other interesting thing we learned from the last round of surveying we did, again, pre-pandemic, was that 36% of center city commuters are multimodal commuters throughout the week. That is, they use more than one way to get to work. Uh, maybe they use transit four days a week, and then on the fifth day, they telecommute, or maybe they uh, drive alone, but they don't do the same thing um, each of their five days. So that's a pretty healthy number of people already kind of accustomed to different modes of transportation. Um, next slide. And then again, right, like telework, 5.7%, that was our headline um, at the beginning of 2020. We thought, wow, that's a, that's a big jump. Um, and again, doubling essentially from 2010 in that rate um, uh, of telework. I think that that netted something like, going back to that chart on a um, couple slides ago, like 11,000 new telecommuters on any given day, pre-pandemic, um, a pretty big number. Next slide. And then again, the, the walking and biking um, increasing slowly but steadily over this time. I think especially as housing um, became more available closer in um, to the center city, you saw that walk rate especially increase, uh, but biking as well as the bike network got built out as we got things like the Westlake cycle track and, and some of the bike lanes downtown. Um, we saw some employers uh, have, you know, a 15 to 20% bike to work rate, um, especially the ones that are on 
protected bike lanes and that have great amenities on site for their for their bike commuters, um, achieving uh, far above the th sort of three three to four percent background rate for bike commuting. And so, Commute Seattle has been doing a lot of work to try to you know get other uh, employers and and properties, especially those that are on new bike lanes. Um, to adopt the same kind of on-site amenities for their bike commuters to try to keep that keep that rate growing as, as much as we can. Um, next slide. So during the pandemic, now this was all that was all sort of the what where we left off. Um, we have some fresh data from our program reports, which happened in the off year between the um, CTR survey cycles. We we did ask this time around. Um, how many people are in the office right now for your company? And again, you can sort of, sort of pay attention to the, to the bottom row here. Sorry, it's a lot of data. But in our CTR affected population in Seattle, there's a population of about 240,000 uh, employees that are represented in this data set. It's not a perfect representation of industries or of all workers in Seattle, but it's a pretty big, pretty big slice. Um, those with 100 or more employees commuting uh, to work during the peak hours. Um, if you look at everyone in our uh, that's affected by this uh, survey requirement, um, it's about 24% of their workers that they report being in the office uh, right now, essentially. However, if you notice the top two industries, again, these are these are shown in descending order with the with the most in office industries up at the top, is health and hospital. Obviously, most people have to go to work. Uh, on site in that industry, life sciences, biotech and research, a lot of people still in labs doing important work. So if we run these numbers again, taking out those top two industries and just look at the in office rate for everyone that's left, we we'll go to the next slide. It, it goes down to 11%. So uh, if you take out the hospitals basically and, and those research labs, all these other industries, uh, 190,000 people represented by this uh, report. Um, we've got about 11% in the office. Again, not a perfect match for every for citywide, um, every industry. Um, but in terms of a lot of those larger employers, you can see, wow, like 11% of people uh, going to work um, on a typical day for these industries. And compare that to the very slow, gradual change we saw over the last 10 years in in mode shift. Um, so obviously, I think this is all known to everyone in the room, but it's it's always interesting to get this data back and see um, see it reflected in in these surveys and program reports that businesses are filling out. Um, next slide. Cool. So thinking about then like where we were over the last ten years, and then suddenly from a transportation demand management perspective, what are the opportunities coming up now because of this? Um, what will recovery look like? This is a picture I took on my commute home. You know, I think that this, I probably snapped this like two years ago, um, heading back. I live in just over the border in Snohomish County. So I take, um, you know, these express buses. There's probably 12 people just in that shot, like crowded into the front of this bus. And as, as Eric just said, you know, 12 people on a 40 foot bus is now a full bus. So, you know, those transit numbers getting to a mode share where we can move half of or, you know, 45 to 50% of the pre-pandemic downtown population via transit is just not possible with these load limits that the agencies have right now to maintain social distancing. So if the demand comes back before the transit agencies or before people feel comfortable enough to get back on transit, where are all those people going to go? How are they going to commute if it's not on a bus? Um, you know, one of the things we think about too, it's a, from the equity perspective is, you know, do we want to tell office workers to go ahead and get back on that bus? You know, is that putting the essential workers at, at a risk that they shouldn't be exposed to, especially if those office workers have a convenient telework option? So, you know, there's this balance between wanting to repopulate offices and, and downtown as soon as it becomes safe, but at the same time, protecting these essential workers and, and transit dependent populations that really need those buses to be, you know, um, to be available and to have the capacity so they're not passed up. Um, next slide. Yeah, and, and driving alone is, um, is, you know, 
like I said, 26% pre-pandemic, but uh, so about 70 to 80,000 trips per day into downtown. Um, there's a physical limit though. We can't have 300,000 people, like every job, drive alone to downtown. There's not enough parking uh, for everybody to drive alone. In fact, I, I don't know the exact number, but I feel like it's on the order of about 100,000 parking spots maybe in downtown Seattle. So at most, that's how many people can drive alone into downtown, maybe a third of the jobs or somewhere in that, in that magnitude. Um, in the short run here, I think it's gonna be extremely attractive for people who need to go into the office, uh, people who um, you know, have the car, have the money to pay for parking, don't feel comfortable in transit for, for um, whatever reason. And you know, that's in, in the short run, while traffic is, is reduced, maybe that's a fine answer, but in the long run, uh, like I said, one, the parking supply is just not there. And two, our values uh, just simply can't allow us to return to uh, everybody driving alone. We, we know that the cost to our, our um, environment, our public health, um, just uh, are unacceptable to, to return to drive alone uh, like we had 10 years ago or more, um, to say nothing of the, of the traffic itself. Next slide. So in terms of opportunities, um, you know, behavior change is what kind of TDM is all about and the work that Commute Seattle has done in partnership with many of you on the call. Um, we want to sustain the good things that have happened. So many businesses uh, maybe had a telework policy pre-pandemic, but no one really teleworked, maybe because it just wasn't part of the culture, maybe because individual managers didn't really allow it or people didn't feel comfortable doing it. Now all those people, many of them um, are doing it. And so can we sustain that? Can we have that be a choice that people make as part of their mixture, again, of a multimodal, um, of a multimodal commute? Um, throughout the week, maybe people will telework a couple of days, take transit, drive alone, bike, uh, uh, you know, carpool or vanpool. Um, and pick different modes throughout the week. Um, the public realm, obviously, I think you, many people on the call are aware and are doing work to, while there's time and while there's space to reallocate some of that car space for active modes, for civic life, for commerce to happen. Um, America has, has far too much uh, space for cars and not nearly enough for bikes and for uh, and for art in the public realm and for um, civic life to happen uh, in these spaces. And so right now there's a huge opportunity, I think, to, to kind of claw some of that back. Um, equity, uh, Eric mentioned this, I'm sure Hester will speak to it as well, but reallocating resources more equitably to boost access for those who really do need public transit uh, and safe biking and walking infrastructure the most. Um, we've seen that we can make incremental change over time in boosting those modes. Um, suddenly we have uh, a behavior change opportunity like we've never had before where, where everyone's kind of you know, done something different and they're gonna be making choices over the next year or two about how they adapt back to commuting into their physical work site. So that's an opportunity to steer them away from that SOV commute and toward shared modes, toward active commuting toward continued telework at some, at some frequency, working with employers and property managers um, and, and directly with, with these commuters is gonna be uh, a huge opportunity to create a more sustainable and equitable mode split for the future. I think that's my last slide. Fantastic, I thought that was really fascinating. Um, I'm not sure, just checking out the chat box now it looks like there are are there a few questions are there any questions in there we do have one question more uh, housekeeping the slides will be available after the presentation we will post those to our website and also make them available um, to the rsvps we'll send them out to as an email Well, I think uh, looks like we can move on to our final presentation of the day. Um, I will turn it over to Hester. 
Hester, right. do you want to run your own slides or would you like I'm me to? I'm going to try with the luck we're having. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> Sounds great. Let me know if you need any help. Okay. I am trying to share a portion of my screen so you can just see the pre presenter view. Does that look normal ish? Yeah, that looks pretty good. Okay. Great. Um, so, hello, my name is Hester Sarabrin. For those of you who don't know me, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the policy director at Transportation Choices Coalition. And I'm here to kind of talk about um, what we did and what we're thinking in terms of um, all the changes that have happened in, in transportation due to COVID kind of short-term response and kind of longer-term recovery thinking. So let's see if this works. Um, so if you don't, if you aren't familiar with us, just a little bit about uh, TTCC. We were founded in 1993. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, though we do structurally have a um, C4 that does a sister organization that can um, run campaigns and, um, you know, do some more political work. But I work at TCC. Um, and we are dedicated to make transportation accessible to all in Washington state. We work on policies that help support more transit, bike, and pedestrian improvements. We work at the state level, the regional level, and at local levels. Um, I think most of most folks know us for our work on transit, whether that's transit ballot measures or supporting King County Metro. Um, but we, I like to think of us as kind of outcomes oriented. So we really focus on uh, healthy, sustainable, safe, equitable transportation. And that lets us look at the system as a whole. It lets us look at for any given mode or project, kind of what are the best outcomes. And it lets us be responsive to what people need, especially in areas where transit isn't um, a possibility due to geography or other circumstances. Um, and so we are a small organization. We're about six folks big. And um, I think for that reason, in a lot of ways, we tend to work on upstream solutions as much as possible since we can't be everywhere in the state. And so a lot of those look like, you know, trying to get funding, better decision making frameworks for agencies and processes, uh, racial equity tools, supporting agencies and others on their racial equity journey, um, which also includes better and authentic community engagement. So we, we, we are we're called a coalition, it's just the name of our nonprofit, but we work a lot in coalition. And that means um, working with agency staff and uh, nonprofit staff really closely. And a lot of our work has to do with getting folks in the same room, sharing ideas across agencies and between agencies and nonprofits. Um, but we don't do a ton of on the ground kind of constituent work. So in early March, um, a lot of things happened and you know we I think for for a couple of weeks really um, had a ton of conversations to kind of figure out what our role could be and um, I think one of the things that we noticed was there there wasn't necessarily just one one space to um, talk about what was going on in in transportation and in transit and people had questions and people were scared and people were kind of wanting to know what other folks were doing. And so, you know, we kind of did some internal brainstorming to figure out um, what our role would be and what our goals were during this really like frantic time. And so I'm sharing with you something that we never made public, but was kind of our internal thinking at the time. Um, what are our goals right now? And they were around protecting riders, protecting drivers, supporting transit agencies, and really trying to figure out how we could step up and, and lead in this space. And I, you know, a lot of you may know, especially those that work at transit agencies, there, there were a lot of policy changes and service changes happening really rapidly. And so um, some of the, the mask requirements and policies were coming up. And so we were trying to hold space between, you know, making sure everyone on the bus was protected, but that there weren't kind of these disproportionate enforcement outcomes that you were seeing in a lot of places across the nation, um, making sure that you know folks that were getting laid off or cut due to service changes were um, supported financially, and then really looking and seeing what our transportation agencies need, whether that was 
um, funding or kind of uh, positive messaging around transit and really supporting um, the agencies and the workers in what they were doing. And so um, again, one of the kind of internal organizational goals we had that really um, was in alignment with these goals of sharing information was creating a, um, a weekly a weekly transportation call. And we just were like, we're putting something on the calendar. We'll see who can come. And um, it was basically intended to share information with advocates. Um, and when I say advocates, I mean nonprofits, but we've really been using advocates in the larger sense to include both you know, nonprofits and constituents and agency staff who are, you know, trying to advocate for good and safe transportation as well um, to share what they were doing policy-wise to kind of share the service changes that were happening. So basically provide, um, provide a, a line of, uh, trans of communication between kind of all, all these different sides. And I think, you know, folks were curious what other agencies were doing. And so they were able to kind of take um, take ideas from one place and implement them in other places. And so um, out of that was born what is now called semi-formally the Washington Transportation Advocates, um, which primarily is just a group that meets every Friday um, to talk about, uh, I would say everything in transportation now. It really did start as a COVID response call um, to talk about, you know, what, what funding shortfalls were we seeing? What possible relief was coming from the feds? What could we do at the state level? Um, what were the policy changes around backdoor boarding that folks were doing and how could they best be implemented to serve everybody? Um, and so this is also my, my formal invitation for anyone that's on this call to join because the more re representatives we have from across the state, um, the, better, the better this call is. And um, it's been really valuable to see how different groups and different um, departments and agencies have responded and really being able to lift each other up and act in concert and help support when is needed um, has been really valuable. So again, um, if you want if you want to join, it's happening right now, I'm going to the, that afterward, but um, please email me and I can put you on our list. Um, I'm also seeing that there are chat things, but I can't see what they are. So Ben, just interrupt me if there's something that I should be addressing. Right, we had one question that was to define the acronyms P-O-C-L-I and R-E-T, which I believe oh. I answered correctly. People of color. Oh, you put that chat? Great. Yes. Yeah, racial sorry. equity tool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so course. one problem with taking a, an internal doc external, but thank you for um, reminding me about acronyms and not to use them. <laughs> um, so, you know, I talked about the, the kind of initial COVID response and it was like immediate policy changes that were happening to ensure the health and safety of um, drivers and riders in transit and, um, and address kind of larger agency issues. But, you know, as, as, as time has passed and some of the, the science has come in and we've made a lot of the changes that help keep people as safe as possible on transit, um, we're starting to think about what is what does a just recovery look like in transportation? And so I'm mostly here to just kind of walk through the framework that we came up with in later 2020, um, but it really has been defining, you know, all that we do. Um, and, you know, I would say that it probably defined a lot of the work we did previously, but there's this intensive focus that is based on changes we've seen since COVID and kind of the pandemic within the pandemic that you've heard a lot of people talk about, which is systemic racism to reflect um, things that have been around and being worked on for many, many uh, decades, but also have been kind of highlighted by, um, highlighted and exacerbated by COVID. So here is the kind of summary slide of the transportation framework. And we really have kind of three main components in it. And one is centering racial equity. I guess maybe we should put that circle in the middle. Um, two is around funding and filling the funding gap that's left by um, COVID and the kind of subsequent economic um, changes we've seen. And then the third is really prioritizing transit. And so I know I said that we don't just do transit, but the framework focuses on transit. We talk about other modes 
including access to transit as well. So just gonna kind of, again, walk you through some of the more details on these slides and it sounds like they'll be made available and I'm happy to answer any questions now or at um, another time. But um, so on the, on the left is kind of the, the context of why we're centering racial equity in this framework. And um, you know, as you know, COVID has really underscored that people of color disproportionately count on transit as a lifetime lifeline. I think you saw that in um, you saw that in Eric's slides around the areas of the city and the county where ridership remained high. It's in really diverse, uh, high proportionate people of color neighborhoods, um, and that's for a lot of reasons. I think that's for who drives transit generally. That has to do with who has jobs where they can telework and who doesn't. Um, and I think essential workers, there are about 30% about of essential workers rely on the bus. And um, that's then therefore reflected uh, in the service changes that you saw from Eric. And so um, we also have seen that health disparities due to transportation system have been exacerbated by COVID. And so air, local air pollution is obviously one of the biggest impacts um, of transportation and that's from all modes. Um, and those kind of um, respiratory impacts really also exacerbated um, COVID response. And again, no surprise, um, a lot of the highways have been, you know, highways and big roads have cut through low income and uh, people of color neighborhoods, um, therefore disproportionately impacting um, those demographics with air pollution and therefore uh, disproportionately those folks are dying from COVID. And then the last kind of thing I wanna talk about is um, enforcement. And so this really ties to the, um, the protests and the racial reckoning we've been having um, this past year and a call for reduced or no police presence. Um, and as we're looking at it in the scope of transportation. And I think the tie really is, you know, we are talking about moving towards more sustainable modes, um, really ca capitalizing on this opportunity to create safe streets and allow people to bike and walk in a way that's socially distant and improves physical um, activity. And um, what we have been hearing is that uh, particularly brown and black communities do not feel safe in public space, um, walking, biking, and often taking transit or driving. And so what we have undertaken in the past six months is really an audit and a cataloging of where, where are the uh, physical and financial harms from policing and enforcement in transportation. Um, you know, the tra traffic stops are some of the most common police interactions and um, the data up and down uh, the jurisdiction, local to the state, and across all modes disproportionately show um, people of color getting stopped more, getting more tickets, having tickets that have like higher fines and higher impacts, um, you know, driver's license suspensions. And, you know, these are, these are stops that also can lead to civilian death from police violence. And so we are really taking seriously that linkage and trying to figure out how it ties in to the work that we do and policies that we can help push um, that focus on it. And so, you know, all this racial equity work or all these, this racial equity context kind of leads to several of the priorities and the kinds of work we're doing on the side. So again, that's um, helping agencies uh, adopt and use racial equity toolkits and do equitable community engagement. Um, where we are funding transportation already, um, ensuring that equity, safety, and health are priorities that help guide where that funding goes, whether that's to particular modes or whether that's, you know, within a mode, where are we allocating more service, just like, um, just like Eric showed. We really need to stop thinking about how many people are riding and who, are, who is riding and how we're serving them. Um, PSRC themselves um, have been doing a lot of racial equity work, 
creating a um, equity advisory committee. So again, these kind of institutional changes where it's not just a one-off, it's really changing how the agency thinks and makes decisions and staff and board members are educated about racial equity and all of these interconnections. Um, and then the policing work, as I mentioned, um, is really looking at the uh, local county and state level to um, figure out where can we make modes, where can we make sure that the system is as easy and safe to use as possible so that it doesn't rely on enforcement for safety as much? Um, where can we take kind of civilian officer interactions off the road? Where can we create incentives rather than fines to actually get people to do the things that we want them to do and that actually benefit them? Um, and stuff like that. Uh, the second, oh no, okay, it's working. Um, the second, the second part of the framework is around just like transit. Transit, there's no future without transit. And that's because uh, the future that is relying on the current situation is like literally relying on transit. Transit is getting people to healthcare jobs and all the other essential work um, we have. And without it, we would have economic collapse. And there's no future in which people don't come back to transit. Like, Things will always be different post COVID, but transit will always be a necessity. Um, I mentioned that 30% or so of essential workers in Washington use transit to get to their jobs. Transit creates jo jobs, so it's part of like economic recovery. It really, um, it really allows job dollars to be spent really quickly too because it's operations and um, it's jobs that you can just kind of like, they're good living wage jobs that you can kind of add and be available really quickly compared to some other um, other kinds of transportation investments. Um, and then, yeah, you know the rest. Transit connects people to opportunity. Car center recovery will just exacerbate all the problems that we're talking about today. So per usual, we are working to, um, in this way, you know, our priorities haven't really changed. We're trying to get money for transit, only it's just a little bit more urgent now and the holes are a lot deeper. So we work at the state trying to get more money for state-based, you know, grants and programs. We have been newly working a little bit at the federal level to really understand how um, transportation authorization works there and ensuring that transit um, is included in any of the relief packages. And we've got really par good partners at the state, Transportation for America and Transit Center, who really understand that landscape and um, have been doing that work. And we've just mostly been piggybacking and supporting it. Um, and then lastly, oh, well, this is basically the same, but you know, it's really, um, it's really about funding. And so we've seen, um, uh, as you know, like really drastic changes to transportation funding because people aren't taking transit, people aren't driving in toll lanes, people aren't taking the ferry, like the ridership the ridership change has led to funding changes, which um, really impact uh, the bottom line for all these agencies. And then obviously there's the economic um, kind of spending changes that have um, affected, you know, more general tax base that transit relies on. And so many people know transit, <laughs> transit really relies on local sources that are volatile and regressive. And so this is part of our broader body of work is to get more progressive, more stable, um, and like more resilient and more, just more uh, funding for transit and biking and walking. Um, oh, you know, there's just so much money for highways and a lot of the gas tax is restricted to be used just on highways. So we kind of perpetuate this issue where we um, spend more on highways and then more people drive and then we've got more pollution and then it's easier to drive and take the bus and then we don't fund the bus and the bus service gets cut and then you don't want to take the bus so like we really need to change the funding structure to be able to fund the things we want and um, support them so you know transit agencies have the the advocacy at the federal level has worked really well and there have been um, there has been transit money included from both relief act packages that have been coming and I believe there's a a package going through the federal government right now that would give another 40 billion to transit, but you know nothing is nothing is set in stone, and so we really need to keep up the pressure 
there. Um, again, we're working at the state to look at new revenue sources. There's a lot of talk about the road usage charge. Um, what would that look like if it wasn't just a replacement for the gas tax, but it did better than the gas tax? Can it be uh, progressive and multimodal rather than kind of perpetuating the status quo and the problems that we have? Um, and then, you know, again, we, we don't run, but we really support local ballot measures for, for transit. And so we work across the state and lo local jurisdictions to support that work. But at the same time, working so that that's not, that's not the only choice for transit, right? Like, why do we just dole out highway funding at the state level, but kind of force not <laughs> force a bill, get authorization at the state to even go to the voters and then go to the voters to even provide transit. So that's something we think needs to really um, be flipped on its head. So that is a really um, big and fast and a lot of me talking at you uh, overview of the work we do and how it kind of fits into this broader recovery. And that is all I have. So thank you so much. Thank you, Hester. Um, before we break off into the breakout rooms, so just want to pause and see if there are any questions. We will also explore a lot of the topics that we've discussed today in the breakout. So I encourage everyone to stick around for the next 40 minutes. Um, we will take about a minute break, a minute or two, but uh, we will use our automatic breakout room powers to separate everyone. Um, very shortly, but if you want to take some time to uh, take a break, grab some water, uh, please do so. Thank you, Hester. Okay, I think we have everyone back. Um, great. Well, I hope our, I thought our breakout group was really uh, interesting and really productive. Hopefully the rest of the crew also had a good experience. Um, but we just have a few minutes left, so I think I can just kind of give a, a brief rundown of what our group discussed. Um, you know, I think we hit a lot of similar topics in a lot of these questions, and a lot of it really focused on um, you know, trying to understand that transit is going to look be a lot different in the future. And with people working from home more, transit agencies are going to need to think a little bit more flexibly or be a little bit more nimble in terms of how they provide service. And also uh, just in terms of either uh, providing service that isn't considered either like peak or, um, you know, high frequency, but really kind of addressing where the essential workers are living and, um, when they're going to work is kind of what needs to be a priority for transit agencies as they continue to provide service to essential workers. And I think, um, you know, just what Claire, you said at the very end, I think is something that I really want to highlight is that, you know, transit is not just, it's not something that gets us from point A to point B. Of course it is, but it is, it's more than that. It's, it's a connector. It really, keeps our communities, it keeps different communities together. Um, and it's really a lifeline and it's more than just transportation. It's really a part of our community and a part of our culture. And so promoting transit isn't just to increase our productivity, but it's really to increase the value of living here and the value of our lives. So um, that was kind of just like the one burning thing I really wanted to say out of it, but I thought we had a really great conversation and we will share notes. Um, with all participants after the meeting, make them available on our website if you want to um, peruse them in more depth. I also think that there's um, there might be interest in people sharing contact info. So I might make a, a little space for us to do that as well if people are interested. Is there, Noah, I'll turn it over to you if there's anything um, that you wanna highlight from your group or if anyone else from that group does. Yeah, we had a really good discussion. Um, we had a really representative group from all over the region, uh, which was very interesting. And I think one of the main things that we took from that was the way that um, different communities and agencies are being affected right now is varying pretty greatly. And also the way that they plan for transit service in a post-COVID world is also going to depend on quite a few factors. Um, some of our participants talked about 
having lower density and that maybe being a challenge to providing consistent service, but also making them a little bit more flexible um, because they can be more nimble and more responsive to things like on demand and just how that sort of evolved over time. Uh, we talked about how the counties are going to look different based on uh, you know, maybe the future of commuting changing as well. Certain, certain counties, Pierce was mentioned, especially as, you know, they might grow, demand might grow um, for local routes and places like that when we see more commuters and work from home. So uh, it, was, it was very interesting um, to hear just different perspectives from these agencies, um, you know, talking about BRT routes, talking about ferry routes and how all of those things have changed. So um, just a hyper local lens is going to be important. And the other thing that, I, that really kind of stuck out to me when asking about how we're planning, um, just transportation planning in the future, there were several different examples of um, scenario planning of like after something as big as a pandemic happens, you don't really just, you know, plan straight up, you're going to have a lot of different options as far as like, okay, this is where our funding is at. This is where our demand is at. We're going to go this route or this route. Um, yeah, it was really interesting. Awesome. Yeah, I think um, I was very, I was very not surprised, but just very impressed with the, the level of discussion and just the kinds of things that our people are thinking about. So I feel very confident that this is going to um, lead to even better conversations and action in the future. But uh, now that we just have a few minutes left, again, I want to thank everyone for attending today. Um, as this is the first 2021 peer networking of the year, um, We'll have more information available about future ones. Our next one is scheduled for April 30th. Um, and topic and speakers are currently being um, developed for that. But um, as for this presentation, we will uh, again post the recording of the event, as well as notes from the breakout discussions and the presentation PowerPoints on our website, as well as send them to you um, via email. Um, and I think everyone who has RSVP'd is now automatically on our peer networking list. So you will get information about future peer networkings. But um, other than that, if you have any other thoughts or suggestions or other feedback, any concerns, I would love to hear from you. 